We're all being watched these days in remarkable ways. Even the dustbins can spy on us. Tiny computer chips embedded in the bins here in Croydon are able to record whether they've been emptied. Before long, these bins could even be monitoring how much rubbish you're throwing out, whether you recycle or not, or if you're throwing away the wrong kind of stuff. It's all part of today's surveillance society. We are saturated in a world of surveillance, particularly in Britain, which is has to be the surveillance capital of the Western world. And some people think it's getting worse. I think we stand on the cusp of a privacy dark age. I think we're very, very close to not being able to roll these systems back. Businesses discovered that keeping an eye on workers and on customers makes very good financial sense. But has corporate surveillance gone too far? Tonight on The Money Programme, we're asking, is big business the real big brother? It's a chilly night in Rotterdam in Holland, but in one city centre haunt, it's always summer. At the Baja Beach Club, there's a new attraction for clubbers. It means they have no need for cash or cards. Joe Van Garlen is managing director of the club, and his idea has proved a big hit for the business. When we started this uh, one and a half year ago, uh, we have people just want to do it for fun, do it because it's new. It's an amazing little device, which can mean there's no need for proof of ID or money to get in. It can all be done with tiny computer chips, implanted in the flesh of clubber's arms. So what do these chips look like? You've got one here, have you? Yeah, I got one here for you. It's, uh, like I told you, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, got to be careful that I don't lose it. It's like a rice thing. It's that's tiny, isn't it? Really tiny. Yeah? Hey, well, that was good. Yeah, lekker. Hello. Hey, I'm with him. All right. So this is the scanning. This is scanning. Normally you pay over here. For clubbers with a chip, no cash is required, and getting in is simple. And over there is my picture. All yeah, right, yeah. You can see straight away. Straight away. And there's another benefit. When buying drinks, instead of paying with money, they can simply have the chips in their arms scanned. Their accounts with the club are automatically debited. Chipping may be popular, but isn't it all a bit intrusive? When they uh, ask us for a chip, you don't have to fill in your address, your disease, <laughs> everything you got, or you're married or not married. Only you, we want to have your name and the amount of money is up. That's, that's the only thing we ask. And that's why everybody is... Uh, Everybody knows that it's, uh, that it's OK for your privacy. Plenty of people here seem happy to be implanted with computer chips. So one day, will we all embrace this kind of monitoring technology? It's so simple. I think that within 20 years, when you get born, you will get a chip. So that's a vision of the future. But are you worried how much your life at home and at work is being monitored and recorded already? You may not realise just how much you're being watched right now. In London and in most big British cities, surveillance is part of our everyday lives. There's no escape on the bus. Everyone is filmed by cameras. And if I was driving, I'd be monitored there too. Every day, hundreds of thousands of number plates are scanned. When using the phone, every call is logged and kept for years by telecoms companies. Every email I send is recorded and kept by the internet providers. 
And when I use a credit card, every penny I spend on this is logged and analysed by the financial data companies. Also, every time I use a loyalty card in a supermarket, they scrutinise what I buy. Thanks. It does feel sometimes that Big Brother is watching everything you do. You can buy the argument that this is all for our own good. It's for a better Britain, it's for a safer individual, a safer society, a more manageable society. You can buy that argument if you want. I don't, because what I believe about surveillance is that ultimately it is used against individuals, not for them. Not everybody would agree with that. On London's tube network, surveillance cameras are everywhere, helping to keep the business running smoothly and safely. The London Underground system has many more cameras than most other systems across the world. Across the whole tube network, we have of the order of 6,000 closed-circuit television cameras. That is doubling over the next five years with the major investment uh, programme we have on the Underground to about 12,000 cameras. And there's another, less obvious monitoring system on the tube. The prepaid tickets used by many Londoners, called Oyster Cards, can also track and record their journeys. The information is useful for planning the service, but it's also useful for the police. Last year, they demanded records of more than 200 individual trips to track suspects. There are very strict guidelines that are required by the police to obtain this information, which actually ensure that the release of this data to the police or law enforcement agencies is very strictly controlled. Um, it only happens in extreme circumstances, but of course it is valuable, very valuable to the police in those particular circumstances. Now, most of us will be happy for the police to be given every help in catching criminals and terrorists. But could the Oyster card open the door to more surveillance? The Oyster card, when it was first uh, proposed, we raised our hands in despair and said, look, you realise what's happening here is you are creating a mechanism across the entire London transport system that has the potential to track everyone's movements. And when that happens, authorities are going to want to use the information. You give information... Um, to any authority and everybody else wants it too. Leaving city centre cameras and swipe cards behind, we might think we're out of sight of Big Brother. We'd be wrong. We're all consumers and with money to spend, we're going to be watched. This business has the ability to track and locate you within seconds wherever you are in Britain or Western Europe, whatever the time of the day or night. Now, it sounds sinister, but millions of us pay them to do it. At the RAC Breakdown Centre in Walsall, they are experts at monitoring their customers. Good morning, Ford RAC. You're speaking to Rachel. How can I help? The RAC handles 10,000 calls a day. So how do they find all those broken down cars? As Simon Sheldon Wilson told me, they can track the signal from mobile phones. How do you use somebody's mobile phone to find them then, locate them when they've broken down? We submit a request into the network and that will take three or four seconds to come back with an approximate position of the mobile telephone. So can we do this with this phone and find out where you are then? Yeah, let's, so let's put your phone from, number in yeah, there. My phone number's there. If we click on search... Um, it's a map of the Midlands. Hearing it, yep and we zoom straight in, you can see Great. now where we Three are. Three seconds later, we're right by the M6 and that's you, isn't it? That's my mobile phone, yep, and that's where we are, just on the M6. That's there. pretty amazing technology, isn't it, to be able to find people like that? It's, it's fantastic. I don't think people realise that capability exists for a motor organisation like ourselves at the moment. The RAC always asks customers permission to trace their calls, but if they can do it so easily, perhaps there's nothing to stop state or corporate snoopers from doing the same. Now surveillance is part of the infrastructure, the urban infrastructure. You don't, for instance, create a telephone system or a communication system without having surveillance capability built into it. So all of this means that now surveillance is infinitely more uh, intrusive and extensive than it's ever been before. Surveillance is even a feature of many modern cars, as RAC patrolman Brett Hunt explained. Some hire car companies install anti-theft tracking devices in their vehicles without drivers knowing. 
there's a lot of tracking systems already out there. Um, a lot of hire companies um, already use tracking systems so they can monitor where their vehicles are at any given time. So you're being tracked by satellite without even knowing You're being it. tracked by satellite without even knowing, yes. And that's a prospect that troubles some people. Could a technology introduced for good business reasons end up threatening our privacy? The driver doesn't have a choice as to whether their movements in a car are tracked and located or not. Of course it may be beneficial in terms of an accident, but we don't have accidents all the time. Sometimes we, we may want to turn these technologies off. We may want to n not want people to know exactly where we're going and why. So, as consumers, there seems no way to avoid being watched and tracked. But what about while we're at work? For call centre employees, there's no escape from prying eyes. Call media makes technology to monitor every moment of the working day. Rufus Grigg is the company's managing director. From the time they log on to the time they log off, all of their time in the day is monitored, except if they have a tea break or, or lunch break, and even then, the exact amount of time they've spent having a break down to the last second is actually there on record. Call Media makes software which runs call centres, including its own. It ensures callers are put in queues and are then put through to agents who are free. And by monitoring agents' working patterns, it makes sure the centres run efficiently. Well, this screen here, for example, is showing a breakdown of agent activity, of what they've been doing throughout their shift. These pie charts here are showing how much of the time they've spent actually busy handling calls, uh, how much of the time they've spent not available. They might be on a training course or on a coffee break. how much of the time they've spent uh, perhaps doing wrap-up work after a call. So it can be a terrifically highly monitored environment. For Call Media's clients, their technology helps to improve call centre efficiency and raise staff performance. But in some other companies, there are complaints that this kind of monitoring isn't used to help employees, but to discipline them. The surveillance monitoring breeds an atmosphere of mistrust because each employee knows that every move they make, every keystroke they, they make, um, every action, every word they speak has been recorded. So that puts them under complete and utter anxiety state. Now, I have uh, a file here of a two-month activity. Um, this is where the surveillance went on one individual and, and they don't in tell employees that they do this either. It's Big Brother watching you and Big Brother watching every move you make. It's not only office workers who are under the gaze of Big Brother. This warehouse full of DIY products is operated by a company called Wincanton. The workers are required to wear computer headsets which tell them what to do and monitor and record their every move. Computer voices tell workers which goods have been ordered by shops and where to find them. It all used to be done with bits of paper, but this new technology is far more efficient. And it's more demanding, as I found out. Uh, 12.05, so again the code, 3.3. Three. Zero two zero one. Right, twelve oh five. Twelve oh five. Twelve oh five. Right, boys. I have six one ready. Uh, one nine. Two. This is like the generation game. It's quite complicated, this, isn't it? And it's not just warehouse staff who are monitored and tracked. When the stuff gets onto the lorries, drivers too will be followed, as Wincanton's Richard Keneally explains. 
Now, amazingly, you can tell how fast he's going. This one down here, so he's doing 53 miles an hour. That's correct. He's travelling at 53 miles an hour. We have his latitude and longitude and the bearing, uh, how many miles he's done, the acceleration. So why do you need to know he's travelling at 53 miles an hour at uh, 5 to 2 and heading northeast? It allows us to know where the vehicle is. It allows us to automatically warn the store of the vehicle's delivery. So they know imminently there's a lorry arriving and when to almost walk out and, and see it turning around the corner. Exactly. This kind of monitoring technology works well for Wynn Canton. Less time is wasted and efficiency is boosted. But in some other companies, the story is not so happy, with warehouse workers and drivers claiming surveillance now dominates their working lives. They feel as if it's like Big Brother watching over them all the time. They're becoming robots. They're not... Um, it's dehumanising is the word that's being used. It will tell them everything about your working day, from when you started, how long you've been driving, when you stopped, how long you were stopped for, how fast you were going. They can monitor exactly how much work and productivity that they've done at any time of the day. It's monitored down to the last minute, even in seconds. You've always got it in the back of your mind that no matter what you're doing, you are being watched. Manual and office work, monitoring is now intense. For many businesses, it helps boost efficiency. But can it backfire? If you give somebody a message that they're not valued, that they're mistrusted, that they can't do their job properly, so you have to monitor them all the time, well, of course they're not going to feel particularly benevolent towards you. So this is the big problem. It's a fine line between maintaining efficiency and efficient use of resources, but also making people feel valued and fairly treated. People don't want the earth at work. They just want to be treated fairly. For many workers or customers, surveillance is a fact of life, but there is sometimes a choice, which means you can shop somewhere else or get a job somewhere else. But there's a new technology coming along that could change all that. Soon, there's going to be nowhere to hide. In a few years' time, most supermarkets could be like this one in Germany. Everything you buy, every penny you spend, can be monitored from the moment you step through the door. So I hope this is going to make shopping interesting. Yes, definitely. It's quite a challenge. Right, what do you have to do first? Log on. First, then. with the card, so that it recognises me. So this is telling the computer who you are and what you bought last time. That's right. The in-store computers find out what regular shopper Lorraine Marbury likes and mark it to her every step of the way. Here's the fruit. You obviously need to get this into the computer, so we've got a bit of... First have to weigh it. Weighing, OK. And this is so. taking a photograph of the fruit and telling you what it is. That's right. So if we didn't know. And this has to be scanned, and then I can put it in. Tells you what it is. I'm looking for white wine. So this is the wine screen. Yes. And so now I've got three choices. I'll go for the cheap one. Two ninety nine. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. And, and here, I can have it show me where in the aisle I can find it. A light will come up onto the floor, and I just have to follow the light. It's like a dance floor. Let's go and follow the light then. <laughs> Now the shampoo is quite interesting because this shelf is an automatic shelf. So every time we move a shampoo, it should trigger an advert. There we are. That's the um, blonde expressions advert, and you can do the uh, brunette expressions. Does that make a difference to your buying habits? I already know that I need the blonde shampoo. I think it's not too much to say that this is the most uh, advanced supermarket in the world at the moment. We really can guide our customers by hand. We really can show them around the store, if they want it, of course. Since this technology was installed three years ago, sales have risen by a third. And there's another idea being trialled, which could bring even greater benefits. Some products are fitted with tiny computer chips, radio frequency identification tags, or RFID for short. Every packet of this soft cheese can now be tracked from factory to shelf and into the shopping basket. 
the RFID chips will transform stock control, ensuring shelves are always full. And this is it. It's a computer chip like a tiny radio transmitter attached to a product. And this is now telling the store, I am a packet of razor blades, somebody has taken me from the shelf and I am on the move. Tesco and Marks and & Spencer have already tried out the chips on some products. Within a decade, they could be on everything that's made. When that happens, there'll be no need to hang around at the checkout like this. We'll simply pass the scanner, which will monitor our purchases and debit our bank accounts, all in one go. I think it's not too courageous to say it's the revolution. It makes us more money, first of all, because we will have more customers. Customers will be happier, they will have a more convenient shopping, and that means they come to our store. Metro stress that they have no interest in monitoring the chips beyond the shop door. On the way out, there's a machine to deactivate the chips, but will all customers use it? And will every company be that scrupulous? So even when you get home and start unpacking your shopping, these razor blades can still be emitting information even when you put them in the cupboard and the technology is there to encode every single thing you ever buy. The potential is there to find out how much you paid for this, where and when you bought it and also what else you own and that's what's getting some people worried. Campaigners claim that one day it might be possible to scan people secretly Information about what they own or how they spend their money could be valuable to nosy companies or snooping authorities. Well, it would be, as far as I'm concerned, the end of privacy. You won't be able to hide from the system by closing your door or closing your curtains or hiding behind a wall or even slipping something into your wallet or handbag. The X-ray eyes of the, of the state and of big corporates will be able to see through those and will be able to see right into your very personal and private life. And how would we avoid those X-ray eyes if chips were implanted in our bodies? For people who worry about privacy, it's the ultimate nightmare. Here in New Jersey, a trial is taking place that some think could have profound consequences. It's at one of America's biggest hospitals and has the highest of motives, to save lives. Every day, scores of emergency patients arrive at the hospital. Doctors need to know their medical histories urgently. Time is at the essence for us. Patients come in either in coma or have altered mental status, uh, and we readily need to get uh, important information on those patients very early on in the course of their care. The idea would be to fit people who might one day need hospital treatment with a permanent computer chip, providing immediate access to their medical records. I'm just going to make a mark of where we're going to put that in chip. Stockbroker Robel Johnson is one of the pioneers. Today he's having a chip implanted in his arm, similar to those on German groceries and Dutch nightclubbers. Okay. Now you're going to feel a little pressure. Okay. If ever he becomes an emergency patient, he can be instantly identified. How did that feel? Fine. That's fine. Okay, great. So far, 40 people have been implanted here. Doctors think it will soon be as commonplace as vaccinations. Right. Okay. You should play that number today. <laughs> Once patients see the benefit of being able to travel within the United States and in the future worldwide and people can have ready access to vital information that might save their life, will, uh, will I think, uh, ensure the buy-in uh, to the general public. The hospitals are certainly buying into the technology. Hundreds are already looking to introduce it. Hi, Mr. Mulligan. Nice to see you again. Long time no see. I At the moment, when a patient is scanned, the chip in his arm simply confirms his identity, so medical records can quickly be called up. And your home ends in 8265? Yes. And Dr. Campanella is still your PCP? Very good, sir.
But in the near future, the chips may become much more sophisticated, constantly monitoring the health of patients. You can see where this is going, where Star Trek is not so uh, far off in the distance, where patients that might be arriving to casualty areas uh, will no longer have blood drawn but just be scanned. Uh, we will get a whole set of vital signs and biochemical markers, uh, and it will rev revolutionize how we practice medicine. But campaigners warn that chips like this could potentially provide access to all kinds of information held about us, not only by hospitals, but by shops, employers and more. All technologies start in a neutral way, and all technologies grow in their power. The humble chip is going to be a million times more powerful, a million times more capable in 20 years. So when you allow it to be embedded in your environment <laughs> and even under your skin, you'd better be prepared for it to be a completely different beast in a few years' time. And there are claims that the chips could even act like tiny transmitters buried in our bodies, permanently identifying us and tracking us everywhere. It would be the ultimate tracking tool because there would be nowhere to hide, nowhere to hide from a technology like that. It could be used to track everybody everywhere at any given moment. The systems of government don't have that kind of information at the moment. Are we going to allow them to get it? These people couldn't care less about that. We're back at the Baja Beach Club in Rotterdam. For people here, implanted chips simply means it's easy to get in and easy to pay for drinks. They're so popular, they'll soon be offered to clubbers around the world. We also have it in the other club in Barcelona. We're busy in uh, Turkey and in Germany. Uh, that's because a lot of uh, guys want to have the concept in their country. And I think it will be a great system to uh, put in all the other clubs in other countries. For businesses like the Baja Beach Club, this kind of technology makes good financial sense. For many others too, monitoring and surveillance systems boost efficiency and profits. There are some very good business and security reasons for surveillance and maybe, just maybe, we're getting worried about something that shouldn't trouble us. But we're fast approaching a point where every aspect of our personal and professional lives can be watched, logged and monitored, whether we like it or not. And if we do ever get to that point, it may be impossible to switch surveillance technology off. I think we stand on the cusp of a privacy dark age. We've got to re-establish exactly what privacy is as an individual and as a society, as a collective and as a group. We've got to avoid, if possible, creating too transparent a society. But we're very, very close to, to these things being so deep-rooted in our systems and in our infrastructure that we won't be able to get rid of them even if we want to. To watch this programme again and for more information, visit our website at bbc.co.uk slash money programme. Next week in the BBC's climate chaos season, we challenge a family to cut their carbon emissions. But can they succeed? Music